What makes Push so different, so special? Is Push really an instrument? Is this thing really an instrument? This thing with the drums and the bass and the lead and the piano and the MPE and the sequencing and the, all this stuff. It's okay, we're gonna check it out in this video. I'm gonna share my insights and best practices that I've learned from being a push user for five plus years and my 15 plus years of playing instruments. So I've been playing guitar 15 years. I play drums, I got a bass guitar somewhere. I love playing instruments. And that's actually what brought me into the Ableton world is being able to have tangible feel and different ways to articulate yourself through instruments, right? So we're gonna talk about it, all right? So let's go back over here. And again, like I come from the background of traditional instruments like guitar, drums, and yeah, like I play in a prog rock band called Dizzy Mystics. Definitely check us out if you haven't already. And I just want to share my experiences around playing instruments, how that fits into the modern age of making music, the DAW, Ableton, Push, and share my experiences of playing what I'm going to call an instrument of the future and share with you my best insights, practical tips, and yeah, some fun stuff. And most importantly, I'm going to show you how you can apply it to your music regardless what instrument you play to level up your music making process, even if you don't play an instrument. And I assure you that you very well can no matter where your skill level is. All right, so we're gonna break it down and I'm going to talk about and show you what makes Push special as an instrument and why it's potentially an instrument from the future. Okay, and we're gonna pepper in my best insights and practices to help you see its potential. And if you have one, unlock its potential. All right, so let's do it. All right, so the first thing I wanna talk about is the idea of playing music versus working music. And as I've said, I come from the background of playing guitar, bass, drums, and bands. And that was like how I grew up and how I got introduced to making music is through playing instruments and bands and loving bands and all that stuff. And recording was always a means to an end. Okay. It was only to record stuff that I'd mostly already created on instruments, right? So for example, if I pop back over here, like I would spend hours just messing around, coming up with riffs. <laughs> Chords. eventually find something I like, probably refine it, play it, find a riff, connect riffs together, try to get a whole song, and then maybe jam with a friend or have a basic drum beat pattern in the software and really do all the writing with the instruments, right? And then go to the software to then record set instruments and then maybe add a few other layers, other overdubs, programming stuff. But when I started, that's pretty much the extent that I used the DAW for, right? And push, okay? Let's put this to the back, you know what I'm saying? A good old ninja warrior, but push, this thing, okay? This thing lets you do that, exactly what I was describing, like working out parts, orchestrating things, remembering them, coming up with a structure, playing it, discovering it, right? Let's go to the overhead. It lets you do this with a DAW, okay? That is essentially why I love this thing. So with push, the way that you create ideas, work out parts, really play it and feel the instrument and come up with a whole arrangement and different parts, etc., is not separate from the medium in which you are recording it. Okay. And that is a big deal because for example, with playing guitar, drum parts, whatever it is, first you have to work out all the parts then you have to remember it, then you have to record it into the DAW to then be able to hear it back and then go from there if you want to refine it, edit it, etc. Well, with something like Push, the environment in which you're working out parts happens in the same place where you can record it. So if you come from the background of playing instruments, right, it's going to really bring that skill set and that tactile experience and just that feel into the DAW, right, through this tool. If you don't play instruments or you got into making music through computers, right? And you're maybe not comfortable playing instruments. You haven't done that a ton. Maybe you have a MIDI controller that you play around with once in a while. So what push does is it takes all the capabilities and 
you know, functions of a DAW and grounds it into a physical interface beyond your mouse and keyboard. That is an instrument, right? And most MIDI controllers give you this ability. It gives you hands-on and tactile control over instruments in your DAW, but push with Ableton, since it was designed by Ableton, has a kind of integration that you can access a lot of the functions of the software directly from the interface, right? So it kind of creates an environment where, hey, you can access like your mixer and you can access the sends and you can actually browse your menu and you can use repeat and you can use the sequencer and all this stuff and I won't go down that rabbit hole, but you can do it directly from here, right? You can go to your devices and change the sounds. You can swap the sounds, you can play drums, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very dynamic, okay? So the whole point is that push lets you do this in the context of the DAW. What I'm trying to get across is that you have an instrument here. So I have a drum kit here. So I have a drum kit. I can sequence this drum kit. If I wanted to like start sequencing in notes and just loop this part, right? Start building something very quickly, right? I can go to a bass instrument and modify the sound of this bass. So maybe we open the filter, increase the drive. Maybe we want to play with an arpeggiator, which I have ready here. Play with effects on top of it, right? So like you can go down rabbit holes of creation very quick, right? I could go maybe to this grand piano sound and have a sustain pedal. We'll talk more about that in just a sec, but play beautiful piano voicings with my knowledge of guitar. Right? And you can access all this very quick, right? Like you'd be very hard pressed to do this in the software so quick. Okay, and why is this such a big deal? Why am I going on about this? It's because when you go to a DAW like Ableton here, this interface is inherently biased to editing, okay? And it can make music production feel overwhelming. It could make it feel overly technical because making music isn't necessarily only about tweaking knobs and finding settings and browsing around this stuff. That's definitely a part of it, right? But there's more to music than that, right? Through this, you're interfacing with your music through editing, right? Through making binary decisions, yes or no, I'm gonna try this or this, I'm gonna try this or this. And it gets very tough to get into the state of, if I go back here, flow, where you're really expressing yourself and discovering this instrument, right? Like you would be very hard pressed to program that in whatever I just played in a DAW, right? And again, it gets you into your body. It gets you into feeling the music. And that's something that I feel is so, so important. Spend, and like, just to be real on a personal note, like I spend a ton of time on the computer for these videos, for like serving clients. When you get into mixing and mastering, you're doing a lot more editing tasks, right? And like, I'm using the computer enough and it's not exactly my idea of a great time to create music, right? It has its place, but I like to have an interface that, hey, I don't necessarily have to look at the screens and, and go down menus unless I want to, especially if you take the time to calibrate it properly so you can access the things that you need very quickly. All right, and I'll say it again. This is why I fell in love with Push is because it provides this visceral control similar to playing this guitar and running it through my pedal board and turning on the delay and my wah pedal and having fun, right? It's the same thing here where you can really get in the nitty gritty, right? I can open up an MPE kit, right? And it has Like you can really get into it, you know what I'm saying? So that's what I fell in love with. And what I found for this is, hey, don't be wrong, there's limitations with push. It can't do everything that Ableton can do, but there's also limitations with a guitar. There's limitations with a drum kit, right? And the beauty is the limitation really appealed to me because don't get me wrong, push is super advanced. You can do like so many things with push that it can be overwhelming. But in general, what it does is it takes the infinite vastness of what Ableton or a DAW can be in terms of possibility and grounds it into something that isn't 
overwhelming right so this thing it kind of gives you limitations it's like you can only have this little screen you only have these pads but you can navigate your set you can go to session view you can do all this stuff right but it also confines you a little bit which is a good thing because if you look at ableton right like this is infinite possibility right and there's a time and place for that don't be wrong but i do like having a more simple interface that i can just get into it really quick okay so what i'm going to do is just let me show you what really makes push different than everything else out there in my opinion so i'm going to be using push 3 as like the center hub for my next album that i'm working on and hey if you want to follow along with the same system that i'm going to be using the same stages i'm going to go through to get an album from beginning to end and share my insights along the way i invite you to join my brand new school community that i just opened totally free to join and there's a free template with this whole system and a pdf and some training and hey you could follow along with me or you could sh share your insights i can show you my insights it's a good time all right so just click the link below to join the free school community and I'll see you in there, super stoked. So why am I limiting myself to mostly using push as the tool for this album? And the reason is I want to make things simple, fun, and also leveraging the power of Ableton. So you might be asking yourself like, why am I making this decision to mostly use push for this next album project? And it's because my goal for this album is to keep it simple, fun, and easy. I just finished another project that was like very cerebral and technical with like program drums and like tracking guitars and all sorts of crazy stuff. And this time I just wanna see how I can move music forward in a way that's a lot more chill and a lot more fun, right? And the reason is that like, I run a business, I serve clients, I have to create content, follow up with emails, I'm a pretty new dad, and I only have so much time to commit to music. So with all of those considerations, right, I need to be able to be flexible and get music making in while I can and still make significant process, okay? And like, hey, I could just jam guitar, right? And I just come up with riffs like I have for most of my life and then piece riffs together and then just record it in the DAW. But like, I've already done that, right? And it's not exactly the same. It's not as quick to produce an entire jam and a whole vibe just with the guitar, unless I'm just doing an album that's just guitar stuff, which, hey, maybe one day I'll do that. But again, that's the advantage of something like Push, right? Is because, hey, I can get an idea for a whole vibe together very quickly, all right? And it's the fact that Push is more than the sum of its parts that makes it special, in my opinion, right? Like, you can have a MIDI keyboard, right, like this, or some, you know, version of a MIDI controller. You can have launch pads, you can have instruments, you can have bass guitars, you can have guitars, you can have a microphone, and it's great. Like, that's all awesome, but it doesn't have a dynamic feel the way that push does. And let me demonstrate what I mean by that, right? And keep in mind, like a lot of these features you can get with mapping a MIDI controller or even mapping your keyboard keys to specific functions, like selecting your tracks and having knobs to control your devices, right? So all that stuff can be done, but it's the way that push kind of brings it all together that appeals to me where I don't have to really focus on mapping all that stuff out. It's very dynamic. And I can focus on mapping stuff that's like one layer deeper of control, right? So let's zoom in on this. Like the first thing is that, hey, we have a specific layout for drums, which is a four by four pad. If you hit layout, you can have 64 pads. I can have a loop selector, right? You can have 16 velocities mode if you hit layout, right? In the heat of the moment when you're jamming out, hey, I can have 16 pads that have different velocities. Right, you could program those in or I could play these in if I wanted to. Right, so there's a lot of flexibility for heat of the moment change, right? If I go over here to this piano, right, I have a full expressive piano that I can use. I have all these, these controls. Well, let's say I wanted to pencil stuff in and I wasn't feeling super inspired to play things in. I hit layout, I can sequence things in, right? I could hit it again, I can have both right? The pads and the chords. So maybe I select like a, all those things and I can pencil in a chord, right? 
And then you can hold that, go to clip view, and maybe we adjust the length, right? So just like that, once you get familiar with this tool, you get hands-on control to what would only be usually done in here, right? So if I wanted to do this here, I would have to, okay, zoom in, find the notes that I wanted by trial and error, or maybe using a controller and then playing them in and or penciling them in. And then if I want to lengthen it, I have to select it and drag it over, which isn't a big deal. Like this is, you could totally do it here. But again, I just like the fact that I can do, use it as an instrument with my hands. Okay, that's just a preference. And once you really get good at this, like, hey, I can hold this, right? Maybe I want it to be the whole thing. Or maybe we hold duplicate and we duplicate it there. And this time we want it to be um, less long, right? And go over here. And then I can go over here and let's say we do we like that chord. That sounds cool. Maybe we go to this major and we put it there and then we hold it length. There we go. So now we have right. And then maybe I just want to go back here, layout and hold layout to get my loop selector. And we'll just loop the, this, this part. Right. So once you get familiar with the machine again, it's like, Hey, it's another interface for a whole DAW. All right. You also have session view, so You can start recording clips. You can start sketching out a song, right? And if you get into sampling, you have a whole sampler. I won't go down that rabbit hole, right? But you can sample instruments. You can chop them up. You can load a sample and chop it up and do all sorts of stuff, right? So that's built in. You have a whole sampler and simpler interface built in to push. You have these expressive instruments with the drums. You have MPE sounds. Like if I go to this MPE kit, depending where I hit the pad has a different feel. So again, this is very similar to playing an expressive instrument. And the kicker with push three is that any project that you work on with this device, right? If I take this and go on my couch or like upstairs or whatever, and I work on something and I like where it's going, I can just bring it into Ableton, right? Go over here, connect it to my computer, go to push over here, boom, and then just copy it to my computer and continue from here. So it's super seamless. All right, all right, so finally, I'm gonna share what I have found to work best working with push as an instrument after I've used it for five years. All right, so let's break it down. Let's switch over here and let's talk from here. So one of the things that I absolutely love about push is, is that it is a marriage between the guitar and a piano. All right, so what do I even mean by this? Well, it's laid out like a guitar in the way that a guitar is tuned in fourths, except for this little kink over here, but we'll ignore that for now. But in general, the fretboard is laid out with, with strings tuned in fourths, right? So we have E and then we have A, D, G, B, and then G and B is a major third, and then B to E is another fourth, right? If you had a bass guitar, it would be only tuned in fourths, right? If you have an eight string bass, then you'd be closer to what push is, okay? What this allows you to do is learn repeatable shapes and visualize harmony vertically as well as horizontally. And the way that it's similar to a piano is that you can have visual feedback on your sharps and flats and the voicings you can play on push are more similar to piano because guitar has the limitation where you can only play one note per string and the way that you can put your hand on the fretboard is pretty limited, okay? And the advantage of being able to see your sharps and flats is that you can learn music theory a lot easier. Plus, it separates your naturals from those flats. So if we break this down, right, the natural notes, all the white keys starting from C is C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then back to C. We have no sharps or flats, right? Now when we get into the black keys, we can have C sharp, right? We can have D flat. So it changes depending on the context. And we can have that same kind of visual understanding on push. Let's go to the overhead so I can show you what I mean. So right now I just have a piano sound. It sounds like this. Okay, beautiful. I have a sustain pedal, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, in just a sec. So I totally love this marriage of two worlds. And like I come from playing guitar. So a lot of the repeatable shapes that I've learned on guitar transfer 
over to push. And it's a very similar way of visualizing harmony where you're seeing the relationship between notes vertically, right? And horizontally versus on a piano, right? We're only going from left to right, right? We're not going up and down. And the thing about push that's different than guitar is that I can play a voicing like this using two hands, right? Playing this shape on guitar would be extremely difficult because we have a kink, so the relationship isn't the same, and then you would have to be positioning your fingers in a way so that you're fretting these two notes and hitting these two on the bottom in the bass and stretching over there. All right, so a voicing like that is very difficult, if not impossible, to get on a guitar, right? Just something like this, just a major nine chord, right? Even if you add another voice on top, this would be next to impossible to play on guitar. And, but you get the advantage of if I just move this shape down, I get the same chord over here. If I go up here, I get the same chord because it's the same chord shape, right? Which is the same as guitar, okay? And that's something in my experience, like playing guitar, and I've always loved jazz music. I've always loved cinematic themes. I love when a piano player can just really get into a, a zone and like get these beautiful extended voicings and really play with them. And that's kind of difficult to achieve on guitar. You almost have to create a vibe in a slightly different way. You're emphasizing rhythm a lot more because you're strumming and you're using those limitations. Yes, you can bend notes and all this kind of stuff, but there was always something that I felt like I wanted to explore in more piano-based voicings, but I never learned the piano to a high level, but I feel like I've learned push to a decently high level at this point. So the advantage of this, again, is that you can have repeatable shapes and you can play voicings that you could probably never play on guitar, right? For example, this shape will always be a major triad. We'll talk more about uh, some chord shapes and some tips in just a sec. But this shape will always be a major triad, no matter where I play it. Beautiful, right? If I just take this major third and flatten it, now we have a minor triad. Same thing, I can move this shape around. Right? So you can develop that muscle memory and you get visual feedback and you get a lot of mileage out of learning one shape. All right, the next thing I wanna talk about is how to interface with push so that it becomes more like an instrument, okay? And the first thing that I wanna highlight, we're gonna go ahead and hit the scale button and we're gonna make sure that we're in chromatic mode. You can be in key mode where depending on what key you're in, you'll only be able to play the notes in that key. Right, and you can play chords and such very easy to explore a key and understand the vibe, but it's very limiting in terms of being able to express yourself fully on this instrument. Plus, for example, this is a major chord and then this is a minor chord, but it's the same shape. So you get no kind of discernment between what kind of chords you're playing visually versus in chromatic mode. That is the, that's how a major triad looks. That's a minor triad, so they look different. So you get that kind of feedback and you can internalize that at a way deeper level. So I always use chromatic mode pretty much, okay? And what I do is I usually stay in C major and I keep the fixed button on. All right, so why do I keep things in C major instead of changing it around to whatever key I'm working in? And what about this whole fixed mode thing? Well, we'll talk about that in just a sec for the fixed mode, but for keeping things in C major, the reason is because in this mode, when you're in C major, in chromatic mode, all of the lit up pads are the same as the white keys on a keyboard, okay? So if I start at C here, and I climb up just the lit up pads, we get our C major scale, which is the same as starting from C here and just playing up the white keys until you hit C again, okay? Therefore, all of the unlit pads are the black keys on a keyboard, okay? So you get that same kind of visual feedback that you would from a piano, which has its advantages. All right, so why is this useful? Well, the first thing is that it keeps this static so that you can actually internalize it and become familiar 
with this as an instrument, right? Like on guitar or piano, you can't change around the keys or the, or the frets on your guitar, right? You got to learn as they are, which is an advantage. It's a limitation, but you can actually go deeper when you set that limitation with yourself. The other advantage is that you can leverage the visual feedback of the natural notes and the sharps or flats when you're exploring chords and different keys. So for example, I know that the key of F has one flat and it's B flat, right? So if we're thinking F major right here, right? And I play up an F major scale, I know that this B flat is the one and only flat in that key, right? So if we play up the scale, right? We have that B flat in the key of F sharp. So you get that visual feedback. You can see that, hey, this is the one and only flat in that key and it's on a dark pad, right? So over time, you start to learn where the sharps and flats kind of live in different key centers and it helps develop a deeper understanding of visualizing and internalizing harmony. All right, so next I wanna talk about this fixed mode, okay? And I keep this on fixed all the time, but I'll turn it off for now just so I can show you the difference. So right now in C major, this is our root note right? And all the pads represent C major. Fair enough. If I go to D major, you'll notice that the pads haven't changed at all, but some magic happened behind the scenes where now this root note is D, right? Different than C. And if I play up the same pattern we just did for C major, I am playing D major. And this can be helpful in certain contexts. Maybe if you're learning stuff still, or you just want to keep it easy for yourself, that's cool. But what I prefer to do is to keep it in C major. All right. But what I would do is if I wanted to play D major, I would keep this in C major. Okay. And I would just simply target the note D so that the note D always stays consistent when I'm jamming around on push. So if I wanted to play D major, I would just start on D and play up the pattern that we just learned, right? To play that major scale. And I know that the key of D has two sharps. It has the F sharp and the G sharp, which these two notes are in that major scale, right? So it really helps you internalize this stuff, both visually as well as the muscle memory as to, okay, this is a D, E, F, G, A, B, C, B flat, right? G sharp, F sharp or G flat, etc. So where this fixed button comes in is that right now, if I change root note, if I change key center, the pads will just magically represent whatever scale I'm in, right? So right here, word C, now G, D, A, etc. And then the pads will change for whatever scale I have selected. What I prefer to do is go to C and keep it in fixed. So now if I go to D major, it shows me D major, but relative to this still being C, right? So now if we look here, here's our D. And if we play up D major, all the lit up pads represent D major because that's where the uh, selection is in our scale. And the advantage of this is I can still reference all of my muscle memory from this being C and all the shapes and progressions I've learned over time. So if I want to play a progression in C, I can still do that regardless of what the pads are showing me, right? So the next thing I wanna talk about that's really been a game changer for me on this instrument is to really internalize the intervals and being able to create inversions intuitively. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so first of all, it's very important to be able to visualize intervals because everything in music is made up of intervals. If you're looking at uh, a chord, it's made up of intervals. If you're looking at a scale, it's made up of intervals. If you're looking at a chord progression, the movement between the chords are made up of intervals. So the easier you can visualize those things, the quicker it's gonna be for you to be able to find whatever you're trying to do on the instrument. And just a real quick intro, I'm not gonna go down the rabbit hole. I've created another video, I'll link it if you wanna check it out to explore all the intervals and start to visualize them. But one of the most important ones to really know is the octave, okay? And you can see it, it tells you all the information right here. We have our root note, here's the shape of an octave, right? There's also another shape that it shows us is this shape. Okay, so you could see it as two pads over and two pads up. One, two, one, two for an octave or three pads to the left and three pads up, right? One, two, three, one, two, three. 
for that octave shape going up or down. Now, why is this so important? The reason is that let's say you have a basic major triad here, okay? If you can visualize that shape, you can see that this note is the same, right? So instead of playing this, I can quickly visualize to transpose this up an octave and play it there. I could also do the same with this one and go here. Okay, I could go up here, octave. You're playing the same chord. We could go down an octave here. These are all the same chords. Maybe we go down an octave over here, right? So being able to seamlessly move up and down octaves gives you infinite potential for voicing chords and creating cool inversions, okay? And it's very important to help you visualize harmony right? Because over time, you'll start to develop a relationship with, hey, from a reference point, let's say F sharp, that's a major third. That's the same major third. That's also the same major third, right? So I can see all that. So maybe when I play a larger chord, I can play this. I know what intervals make up this chord. Root, fifth, major third, there's the seven, and there's the nine on top right? And if we are very aware of that, we can bring this down an octave. Here's our seven, right? Here's our nine. Can bring this down an octave here. There's your nine, right? So you can play that same chord down here, or you could have a more open voicing. Maybe you want to kick this up an octave, right? It gives you a lot of freedom. Okay. So a couple last things I want to mention about the idea of intervals and inversions and moving things up and down and facilitating your ability to visualize harmony on this instrument is the idea of really connecting with the intervals at a deep level. All right. So for example, with this root note, we're in C. If I want to play a major third, I know that this distance is a major third. Like I've internalized that. I also know it's up here. And I also know that a major third inverted going downwards is the same shape as a minor six, right? So what does that mean is from this reference point, I know that the shape of this minor six, but going down from this reference point will give me my major third, right? And you can see that relative to this C down here, that's a major third, right? So we're being able to visualize the, ma the major third interval going down from a reference point. And the inverse is true as well. Let's say from here, we play this minor six, right? Well, I know that going down from this reference point, a major third, this shape is going to give me that minor six, right? Just going down, right? This shape is, if we're going from this point going upwards, is again, that major third. So there's a relationship there. And really being able to visualize and internalize what an interval looks like going horizontally, going vertically upwards, or going downwards is super powerful, okay? Because it gives you freedom to, hey, instead of playing the major third up here, I'm going to play it down here in the bass, right? Gives you a different, vo different vibe, right? Instead of playing the five up here, I know that it's a four below. So now we're playing an inversion of a major chord, right? Just from being able to individually piece together how those intervals look like. All right, so the next thing I wanna highlight is just a few best practices and tips that I found to work within the limitations of push because every instrument has limitations, which is what makes it what it is. And that's great, but sometimes it's useful to know a few practical tips. So one thing I want to highlight is that you have two hands that you can voice chords with on push. Okay. But there's again, limitations to how you can place your hands, right? Like it's, it's really hard to cross your fingers, right? So there's a certain amount of ergonomics that goes into being able to play stuff on push. And the first thing I want to highlight is that let's stick simple and let's look at a major triad. So we have our root in the key of C major third, perfect fifth, right? And this shape is decently comfortable to play. Like you could totally play this. Same with a minor triad it would look like this, right? And yeah, you could get away with this, but it's very hard for you to, to like add another voicing here. Like, it's, you know, put your thumb underneath or like stretch this finger out. That's really hard. So you're kind of locked in to this position, right? And it's not that comfortable to play. What I much prefer to play is instead of this shape, which is also sounds pretty basic, is to kick this up an octave and go a little bit more vertically where I could play this shape, right? And this position feels very comfortable. And all I have to do to change this major triad, which is in more of an open voicing, 
right? Is to lower this major third to a minor third to play a minor triad, right? And having a more comfortable position for your hand to play a basic triad is such a game changer, right? Because it's just more relaxed and you have the ability to add in other intervals if you want. If I wanted to add the major seventh, I could add it underneath with one hand, right? If I go to the minor triad, I can add the minor seven down here. And that's decently comfortable, right? Versus doing this with one hand is very difficult, right? Versus this, same chord, way more comfy, okay? The other thing is I've been holding a sustain pedal for most of this. This is what it sounds like without a sustain pedal. But if you plug in just a simple guitar pedal into uh, one of the pedal slots at the back of push and you hold it now, right? You can let the sustain do some work for you, especially if you're trying to hear harmony and how you can move around. Right? Etc. The final thing I want to highlight for playing this like an instrument melodically, we'll talk about drums in just a sec here, is just really injecting the humanness and the feel into your performances. Okay? So the first thing to highlight is to practice shapes in a way that's comfortable for you. So for example, like we just covered this major triad and an open voicing, this minor triad and an open voicing. These are very comfortable to play and I would practice moving them around. So that eventually you're not thinking about how are my fingers landing? It becomes muscle memory. And that is a key thing to start to develop some mastery with an instrument is that muscle memory, because with the muscle memory, then you can feel the music and you can really feel your way into the music instead of thinking and struggling to place your fingers and think about what notes you're playing, right? Over time, you can just nail a major chord very quick and it's muscle memory, a minor chord, right? Once you start getting more advanced voicings with two hands, you can start to see like, hey, this is a major seven shape, right? And I just can hit that very easily because I've practiced, right? Same with a minor seven voicing. If you can start to move that around super easy, right? Then it becomes easy to explore and, and check it out, right? And especially if you stack on top understanding what intervals you're playing, because here it's like, I know that's the seven, right? I know that's the three. I know that's the five, right? Etc. If you're going to go ahead and add some voicings, I know that's the nine, right? So you can really target those things. Let's say you're jamming on top of this nine, seven, three, five, one, right? So that really helps as well, right? When you start to feel this stuff and it becomes muscle memory, second nature, and you can start to lose yourself with the music, right? Which is the same thing that I've developed with drumming, with guitar, uh, with bass, not so much piano, but with push for sure. Another thing that's worth highlighting is over time, you'll start to develop your own way of expressing yourself with the instrument, right? And a few things that I found is that, especially with like a piano sound and you have a sustain pedal, is that instead of landing on a chord all together all the time, right? You can actually add some humanness and dynamics by cascading your fingers, doing that very quick, right? Right, so what this allows you to do is be a little bit more expressive and give you a little bit of leniency in the timing where if you're moving between chord shapes really quickly, you can actually anchor your thumbs first and then let your fingers fall to the rest of the chord. Right over here, we'll go minor, right? But notice how I'm landing my thumbs first to anchor me as I'm moving around and then letting my fingers cascade. So it lets you get away with not having to land everything all at the same time. All you gotta do is make sure you land your thumbs at the right time and then the rest can kind of come up, right? So that's something that you can totally do and find your own way with. So another thing you can do is like tickle <laughs> these pads because especially with push three, they are so sensitive, which I love. So for example, with this chord, I could just take the higher voicing this kind of shape, right? And we can, with the sustain pedal, just lightly tap the pads and create like a nice atmosphere. Move it down. Move it to this shape.
right? You can add the velocity and really make this an expressive performance. Quickly, let's move over to rhythm, right? So with rhythm, I just have these 16 pads here. I like to lay out my drums symmetrically to emulate what a real drummer does. And I've been playing drums for quite a while. And the whole thing that gives a human drummer feel is the fact that they're alternating their hands and they're kind of getting a really cool motion going. And usually a drummer is going to be more dominant with one hand than the other, like most of us are. So that will add a lot of articulation and emphasis and accents that come out in a performance that just makes it more dynamic, right? So I just have a mirror image. I have like a hi-hat uh, here, the same sample, but now I can alternate my hands. Right, I have open hi-hats right over it. And things can get really fun and expressive in finger drumming land <laughs> with push as well, right? This is another thing that makes push so awesome is you can customize it in a way that matches your skill set, what you want to explore, and eventually find stuff that works for you. So for me, I really like the ability to be able to alternate my hands for coming up with drum patterns. right? You can get all sorts of fun stuff. The final thing I want to highlight about push is that all of the functions in terms of editing clips and looping parts and sequencing parts with its specific ways of visualizing a sequencer are all things that you can internalize just like an instrument. So for example, instead of just playing things in live all the time, well, we have a sequencer here that I can leverage and understand how it works, right? So I can pencil in notes. I can pencil in hi-hat notes, maybe over here, right? Do something like this. We can go into clip view. You can hold these things and you can edit it, right? So again, it almost makes editing things in the DAW performative, right? Where it's really interactive with your hands. I can edit these notes, right? I can extend the loop if I wanted. I could focus on a specific part of the loop while still kind of jamming out. I could change the layout, right? And get 16 velocities on this kick drum and perform these in, or I could sequence in these lower velocity notes into the sequencer, right? I could go lay out again and just have 64 pads of all sorts of different sounds and load it in and then perform them and loop them and move them around, right? So there's so much stuff you can do and you can internalize this in the same way that I was showing you stuff with the keyboard is you can internalize all of these functions so that it becomes an extension of you like you're performing an instrument, right? Same thing with the piano, right? You can play parts in like this. Awesome. But you can go layout and you can pencil notes in. You can go to your scale, go in key. So then you'll only be sequencing notes that are in your key. Get out of here. You can go layout again and you can both play notes and you can pencil in specific notes or chords. All right, so with that said, I think that anybody would be hard pressed to say that push is not an instrument. It is definitely an instrument and it's actually beyond the scope of a traditional instrument, which is why I think it's an instrument of the future. But I'd love to know your thoughts down below. Do you use push? Do you use it as much as you'd like to? Do you not have one? Do you think it's not an instrument of the future? Do you think it's just like a fancy tool? Let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to know what your thoughts are. If you have a push and you're still learning how to do it, I encourage you to watch this video where I break down everything you need to know in terms of using this device at a high level within an hour crash course. You'll love it. And hey, if you're still learning how to play this like an instrument and you want to learn a little bit of music theory, like we covered briefly in this video, I'll link the other video above where I teach you and run you through all the basics of music theory using push. And with that said, hey, I'd love to know what you'd like to see next on this channel as well. Like I love making push videos. We could talk about designing instruments. We could talk about more music theory, more advanced chord progressions, or I'm happy to check out other stuff that's not related to push as well, like Ableton tutorials, more mindset stuff, taking songs from beginning to end, playing guitar, playing drums, playing bass, 
Sky's the limit. I love it all. All right, so I'd love to know what you want to see next on this channel, what you were hoping to learn, what would be helpful for you to continue to level up as a musician, as a producer, as a mixing engineer, so you can continue to finish amazing music that you love. So with that said, I will see you in that next video.